my fellow weirdlings, it's Margot, and today I'm talking about a very brave and eccentric man named Joseph Mensik, affectionately known as The Last Knight. If you're ready to hear about the modern day Don Quixote, keep watching. Recently, I've noticed this meme about the last night circulating again on social media, so I, being the way I am, decided to get to the bottom of how much of it is actually true. It was slow going at first, but I actually did manage to dig up a fair amount of information on Joseph Mensik that goes beyond the meme, the Reddit threads, and the cursory mentions on weird and obscure history pages. Briefly, we should talk about what a knight actually is or was. In the Middle Ages, knights were the best soldiers in their respective kingdoms throughout Europe. They fought for lords or nobles, often receiving land in payment, and lived by a code of honor called chivalry. The era of the iconic armor-wearing knights on horseback lasted from about the 8th century into the 16th century, mostly in the time before guns and gunpowder were the norm, when battles were fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat using swords and lances, among other things. Eventually, national armies replaced feudal armies. Though many knights were absorbed into these new armies, heavy armor and lances began fading into the past from the Renaissance onward. A romanticized look at history tells us the last true old-school knight was Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I, who lived from 1459 to 1519. Much like Joseph Mensik, Maximilian I had a deep passion for the trappings and ideals of knighthood. Other historians feel the last knight was Franz von Sickingen, a German knight who lived from 1481 to 1523, who actually had spent some time in the service of Emperor Maximilian I. Von Sickingen, along with Ulrich von Houten, led the Knights' Revolt of 1522 to 1523 against Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, Maximilian I's grandson, and was one of the most notable figures of the early period of the Protestant Reformation, one of the key events that signified the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the early modern period in Europe. But depending on your criteria, neither of those men may have been the true last knight, because many are adamant that the last knight, fearless and chivalrous, could be found defending his kingdom against the German army as recently as World War II. Joseph Mensik was potentially born in Ushhorod, Ukraine, on February the 20th in somewhere between 1867 to 1870, to Maria Mensik and Joseph Mensik. I say potentially because I really can't confirm any of this. He may alternatively have been born in Czechoslovakia, but that Ukraine information is really oddly specific, if it's not true. One account specifically mentions him being from the small Czechoslovakian village of Podlisi. He also potentially had four siblings, named Maria, Emrik, Irin, and Istvan, or these four people could be complete figments of someone's imagination, obscure Eastern European fan fiction or something. Everything I managed to find out about his early life was written in broken English or loosely translated by Google and full of contradictions. I'm doing the best I can with what I have to work with. So not much seems to be known or confirmed about Joseph's childhood or education. But we do know enough about his adult life for an interesting story. We know that he was living in Dobresh village in Strakonitsa, Czechoslovakia by 1911, and that's where he lived out the rest of his remarkable life. Strakonitsa is a district in the South Bohemian region of what's known today as the Czech Republic. Joseph was married to a woman named Emma Mensikova. Some reports claim he had two kids, while others say three. Again, there were oddly specific names listed for the children on some sites, but every account gave completely different names, so I'm not really going to bother trying to work that out. It's not important for the purposes of this video. I can't find any record of what Joseph actually did for a living, but it certainly sounds like he had money to burn. Joseph Mensik was an avid aficionado of medieval history, so when Strekonitz's somewhat dilapidated Dobresh fortress partially burned down in 1911, he jumped at the opportunity to purchase it from the bohemian aristocratic Schwarzenberg family and soon began reconstruction. Up until that point, the part that burned had actually been a functioning school, with 320 students in attendance. The fortress was sort of its own little self-contained village for a while, it seems. 
The first known written mention of Dobrèche Fortress was from 1377. It sustained a lot of damage and reconstruction over the ensuing centuries, and changed ownership many times. By the time it came into Joseph's possession, it was a rambling mishmash of Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque architectural styles, and greatly damaged by the fire. It was quirky, it had character, it was perfect for the modern-day night of Strakonitsa. It's actually a really interesting property, with secret passageways now buried underground and lots of different buildings and ornate details. I'd want to buy it too. Joseph collected medieval mementos related to knighthood, often buying them on the black market or smuggling them out of France. Throughout his castle, the collection of antiques and curiosities continued to grow. He even placed a wooden crocodile on the moat in memory of the real coach crocodile that had once lived there, brought back from one of Christoph Koch's expeditions. The Koch or Kochik family built the original Dobresh fortress at the end of the 14th century. I'll add the story of the crocodile at the end of this video. Joseph did his best to live his life by the Knight's Code of Chivalry, with courage, honor, courtesy, justice, and a readiness to help the weak. He rode around the area on horseback, dressed in full medieval-style armor, which he'd had custom-made in France. He rejected modern conveniences like electricity, using candles and torches to light his castle home. One Czechoslovakian magazine article from 1936 described Joseph as an incorrigible romantic who fully embraced himself as the lord of the castle. Joseph would approach school children and try to get them excited about medieval history. He also hosted school field trips at his castle. Locals remember him as having a great spirit. He was known for being honest, kind, courteous, generous, and helpful to all who crossed his path. He was very well liked and well respected throughout the region. He became a local celebrity. That's what the lore tells us, but it apparently wasn't always that way. That 1936 magazine article went on to say, quote, He endures various grievances from his fellow villagers, the peasants who before his arrival had devoted themselves irreverently to picking up rubble, do not love him. Because he bought the castle and that he took action at the monument's office against the evil, he still keeps the 15-year-old deer Hassa on the first floor of his chambers in a rather limited space, end quote. That's confusingly worded, but I get the gist that this outsider came in, took over the village's castle, and was convinced he was some noble knight, and the locals maybe felt he was lording it over them. It's clear they didn't really like him. And does this say he kept an incredibly elderly deer named Hassa inside where he lives? Something may have been lost in translation there, but I suspect they do mean an actual pet deer. The article also described a visit to Joseph's castle, where they said, quote, We entered through the gates into the courtyard, eager, eyes on the top of our heads, eager to meet the knight as soon as possible. The strong carved door, equipped with the coat of arms and business card of the lord of the castle, opened, and a bearded, barefoot man stumbled out of the darkness of the castle. He tripped right in front of us until his bones cracked. Damn, I almost hurt my thumbs, he said quite impersonally and unchivalrously, laughing at us. Little knight, he moved a wide straw hat pierced in one place to the back of his head, tapped ash from the carved pipe, and greeted us cheerfully. A lady knight came out behind him, also barefoot, in a patched skirt with a rag in her hand, and several knights flashed on the steps. He invited us to his residence. End quote. I guess that part speaks for itself. Aside from the night stuff, don't we all know someone that's like this really? I've known many. I'm probably one of them. The local community called him Fosadi Tata, which means bearded father, or Poslensky Reiter, which means the last night. It's said that Joseph dubbed himself the Knight of Strekinitsa. I sincerely apologize for completely butchering the Czech language throughout this video. Another odd thing Joseph is remembered for among the Dobresh locals is described as his pub ritual. Before leaving the pub, he'd always swallow a whole herring, washed it down by chugging a tankard of rum, and roared menacingly to express his satisfaction. There are still Strekin Yitza locals alive today that vividly remember Joseph Mensik. Understandably, he left a lasting impression. But there was one particular incident in 1938 that ensured Joseph would never be forgotten as a local hero. 
1938 was quite historically significant. The Germans have dubbed it the fateful year because it marked a turning point in the Nazi party's efforts to push Jews out of the German economy, aggressively stripping them of their property and moving them into ghettos. Synagogues were lit on fire and Jewish-owned businesses were destroyed. Many Jews were shipped to concentration camps and Germany was preparing for war. In September of 1938, a conference was held in Munich, Germany between the leaders of Great Britain, France and Italy in which they signed an agreement to allow Germany to annex certain areas of Czechoslovakia, though Hitler violated that agreement just five months later, invading the rest of Czechoslovakia as well. They pretty much signed Czechoslovakia over to the control of Adolf Hitler. This was intended to avert the outbreak of war, but considering World War II began the next year, I guess it wasn't their finest negotiation. Hitler had already annexed Austria into Germany, and acquiring Czechoslovakia was the next step in his plan for creating a greater Germany. The Czechoslovakian government had hoped that Britain and France would come to their aid in the event of a German invasion, and were prepared to fight. But instead, they were basically handed to Hitler on a silver platter, and were forced into submission. But our intrepid hero, Joseph Mensik, in the true spirit of knighthood, wasn't about to go down without a fight, or at least a protest. As Nazi tanks arrived in Czechoslovakia months before the onset of World War II, they found the road blocked by Joseph, in his suit of armor sitting atop his horse, brandishing a sword, refusing to allow them entry. The Nazis hesitated for a while, unsure of what to make of the unique individual before them. Eventually, they laughed, and gestured to each other with the tap of a finger to the head, apparently assuming Joseph was insane. Joseph couldn't do much as a lone knight with just a sword against German tanks and machine guns, but he was willing to die to make it clear that the Nazis were unwelcome in his country. He continued to stand his ground. And then the strangest, most un-Nazi-like thing happened. They went around him, allowing him to live to tell the tale. Thus began the German annexation of Czechoslovakia and Joseph Menzik's reputation as a true Czechoslovakian hero. Joseph's tenacity was regaled and respected by all. He's still regarded to this day as a courageous soldier who did his best in a hopeless battle against one of the most evil enemies the world has ever seen. Germany occupied Czechoslovakia until 1945 when World War II ended. By that point, an estimated 345,000 Czechoslovakians had been killed. 277,000 of them were Jews. This was followed by Czechoslovakia's bloody revenge on many Germans still living among them. A very dark period of history on so many levels. From 1948 to 1989, Czechoslovakia was controlled by the Soviet Union. It wasn't until 1993 that Czechoslovakia separated peacefully into two new countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. The Strekonica area where Joseph Mensik lived is now located in the Czech Republic. Joseph Mensik continued to live in his fortress, now known as Dobrez Chateau, until 1945 when it was nationalized. I couldn't find the story behind that. Nationalization is the process of taking privately controlled companies, industries, or assets and putting them under the control of the government, so it doesn't sound like something Joseph would have done by choice. In fact, it's said that he died just a few days later, on November 19, 1945, of the proverbial broken heart. He was either 75 or 78 years old, depending on who's telling the story. Technically, knights do still exist today, but it's an honorary title bestowed upon celebrities, politicians, and other notable figures. Many of today's knights would probably faint at the thought of going into battle. In fact, most of today's knights probably would have been the financially elite nobility who would have paid the knights of yesteryear to go into battle on their behalf. Joseph Menzik's beloved Dobrez Chateau still stands. It's been protected as a cultural monument since 1963. I found Czech websites stating that it's currently open to the public, with Joseph's collections on display, and it's still a popular destination for school field trips to learn all about the history of knights and the local man who brought knighthood back to life. Apparently, it's also used to host events. I even found one site advertising it as a venue for an international jazz festival. 
One site says, Since 1996, the main part of the grounds of the castle and fortress in Dobrash has been operated by the Association for the Restoration of Dobrash. But it's also listed on other sites as being privately owned and inaccessible to the public, so I'm not sure which it is at the moment. Nowadays, Joseph Mensik would probably be considered a reenactor, or a method actor, or a rich eccentric, or your weird uncle or something. Though he got off to a rocky start and walked the thin line between bravery and insanity like a tightrope, he eventually earned the respect of the people of his realm, as all of the most gallant knights had done before him. So this is some additional information on the crocodile that was once kept at Dobrash Castle for the people who are into getting completely swallowed up by internet rabbit holes like I am. Earlier I mentioned that Mensik had made a wooden recreation of this crocodile for his moat. After I'd finished my research on Joseph Mensik, I came across a Czech website with a long detailed story all about Christoph Koch's crocodile. This is a condensed version of what it said. Christoph Koch is described as a brave and noble knight who followed the example of other famous knights and went on a journey with his retinue to win honor and glory in distant lands. He got as far as the sea to Venice, where he marveled at many unseen things. Returning from there to his homeland, he took with him a collection of various monuments and foreign curiosities, among them a young, live crocodile. At that time, the yard of Dobresh Castle was a well-tended park with a small pond in the grass. Coach set up an enclosure around the pond for the crocodile and assigned a reliable servant named Rokoka to care for the animal. The crocodile got so used to Rokoka's company that it would follow him around like a dog. Sometimes the young crocodile would run around the property, playfully chasing chickens, ridiculously wagging its long tail. Over time, visitors to the castle got used to seeing the crocodile hanging around and didn't see it as a dangerous animal. But as the crocodile rapidly grew larger and stronger, it would unsurprisingly chomp chickens and ducks that crossed its path. Soon, it was no longer possible to let the crocodile out of its enclosure without putting a strong leather muzzle over its face, as he'd become a threat to the children that played in the yard. One evening, Coach hosted a May festival on the castle grounds. All the area knights and their families gathered, admiring Coach's beautiful park, horses, and hounds. But of course, most of their attention went to the crocodile, which weaved amongst the guests like any other pet might. It was a hectic event with many guests and servants in attendance. Even Rokoka, who could normally give the crocodile all of his attention, was needed to help replenish food and drinks at the tables. Late in the evening, Rokoka finally found time to return the crocodile to its enclosure, remove its muzzle, and give it something to eat. He was careful to close the enclosure gate behind him, and return to his other duties. At the end of the night, an exhausted Rokoka went straight to his bedroom and immediately fell asleep. He woke to bright sunlight the next morning, quickly ate his breakfast, and went to feed the crocodile. The first thing he noticed was that the enclosure gate was open. Then, he realized the crocodile was nowhere to be found. After a search of the grounds, Rokoka saw that the gate from the park, surrounded by a thick wall, was also open, and concluded that the crocodile had escaped Coach's property completely, to the fields and meadows beyond. He concluded that some of the previous night's guests had either carelessly or maliciously opened the gates. Coach, of course, was furious, and unfortunately, after a fruitless search for the crocodile, took his anger out on Rokoka, who was fired and kicked out of the castle. What followed was a bit of a public panic. Rokoka, who at the time had found work with a local yeoman, began hearing stories of animals wandering to a nearby ravine and failing to return. After the loss of a sheep, a calf, and a colt, villagers became fearful of the ravine. Apparently, there was already some local lore about the ravine, it was said that Christoph Koch's daughter had previously been killed in that vicinity. There was a belief that she'd been killed by an evil, cursed being called Baba Yaga. Some of the townspeople were now convinced that Baba Yaga was killing again, but Rakoka suspected the killer to be Christoph Koch's missing crocodile. He staked out the lake in the ravine and eventually witnessed a young deer getting snatched by the leg and pulled under the water by an unseen creature. He told a member of the coach family what he saw, afraid to speak to his former employer directly. 
The family member, convinced Rococo wasn't to blame for the crocodile's disappearance, told Kristoff what he'd heard. Coach ordered the lake to be drained. As the water level lowered, he saw the remnants of animal bones and noticed that all the fish had disappeared. He knew Rococo was telling the truth, that the missing crocodile was hiding there. Soon, onlookers spotted the crocodile in the shallow water. Hunters showered it with arrows and spears, but were unable to impale him. The crocodile became enraged. Rokoka stepped out of the crowd of spectators and asked permission to fight the crocodile. He swam to the bottom of the lake with his spear and sank a sharp blow into the crocodile's guts, just as the crocodile ferociously lunged toward him. The crocodile's body floated to the top of the water in a pool of blood. Rokoka emerged uninjured. The crocodile's body was taken back to Dobresh Castle, where it was taxidermied and kept on display in a memorial to the beloved pet. It's said to have traveled to Vilhardis Castle later with a gift. During the Thirty Years' War of 1618 to 1648, it was destroyed in a castle set on fire by the Swedes. Rokoka was accepted back into the employment and home of Christoph Koch. He and his descendants remained in the service of the Knights of Koch for many years. When Joseph Mensik came into possession of Dobresh Castle, it seems he did his best to honor the legacy of the Knights of Coach and their famed crocodile by carving a large green-colored wooden likeness of the beast and bringing some of the glory of the castle's medieval history back to life. It could be said that his legacy also honors the brave and caring servant Rokoka. It goes without saying that the crocodile's fate was absolutely tragic and it should never have been taken out of its element and kept in a park as a pet to begin with. It's unclear whether Mensik's wooden crocodile is still on display at Dobresh Chateau today. None of this is exactly well-documented history outside of the absolutely tiny Czech community where Joseph Mensik lived, but it's definitely a story worthy of telling. I hope I got it at least mostly accurate. That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this story and will come back for more. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and bring your friends, family, COVID pod, cult members, invisible friends, or enemies. And if you have any opinions on this topic, I'd love to hear all about them in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.